You're listening to the Packernet Podcast Network. Ladies and gentlemen, welcome once again to the Packernet Podcast. I am your host and resident panelist, as always, Ryan Schlipp. Check us out online, packernet.com. Find me on Twitter, pack underscore that am. So I do apologize about yesterday. Just one of those things. Um, lots, lots of family of stuff. stuff. Nothing bad. Just, uh, hey, I got this and then I got this. Need you to watch the little one. So just wasn't time. But we got one today. We do need to uh, pretty rapidly turn our attention to the Rams because we haven't really done so so far. I want to start with... Matt LaFleur's press conference just to kind of kick this thing off and get us looking in that direction. First of all, the question of David Bakhtiari and what his situation is like. Uh, Remember, he's uh, last I heard, he's not going to be playing. I don't know if there's any newer developments on this. But remember, this is not pertaining to his knee. This is because of an appendectomy surgery. Um, I guess the good news, if there were any good news here, is, first of all, it's not pertaining to his knee. It's pertaining to something that I don't think has anything to do with long-term health. I don't think this has any... There's any reason to believe that this is going to be a thing that keeps coming back, like, oh, man, that surgery is jacking him up. Uh, And so, essentially, what it is, is time for his knee to heal, to get some rest, um, which I don't think could be a bad thing. But here's what Matt LaFleur had to say about that. Any any feel on Dave, of whether he can come back at all? We all know about high ankle sprains and all that, but we don't know about appendectomies. And yeah, I, I'm just learning about that too, Bill. Um, I haven't, I don't know if this, this is the first time I've been around a player that has had one of these, uh, at least in the season. So we'll see how, how he progresses throughout the course of the week. And obviously he's a guy that doesn't need a lot of time on the field to get out there and go play. So if he's capable of doing that, um, you know, it's probably a long shot, but we'll see. So there you go. Probably a long shot is the latest, again, that I've heard about uh, David Bakhtiari playing on Monday. But for a lot of us, well, there's several different camps you can be in. Number one, I still really want to get into the playoffs. I think we can go on a run and win out and get in. And we don't have David Bakhtiari, and that sucks and really hurts our chances. Two, I really want to get into the playoffs but I think we got a great shot with Zach Tom because he's awesome also. The third camp would be, I don't think we're going to get in. I don't really care about getting in. So yay, we get to see Zach Tom because we need to see more of the young guy and he needs to get more practice. So for most of us, this isn't necessarily a negative, probably closer to a positive. But if you're not a big Zach Tom fan or don't think that he can necessarily hold it down and you really still are trying to get us in, then um, yeah, that might be a little little rough. The next logical follow-up question is uh, Matt LaFleur's thoughts on Zach Tom. Certainly not like a rookie. I mean, he's stepped in there and, you know, you talk about just not flinching in any, in any moment. He's done that. He's stepped right in and I feel like for the most part, he's played at a pretty high level. So I'm excited about Zach and the flexibility that, again, another guy that can come in and play multiple positions. You can't have enough guys like that. Obviously, there's such a thing as coach speak, but you can kind of tell when when a coach is not just kind of saying, um, speaking in generalities. This this is sort of the way that the coaching staff speaks or spoke about Elton Jenkins, Um, saying, first of all, that he's not playing like a rookie. That's not a generality. That, That is saying he is above and beyond the rookies that we have, um, the rookies that we've had in the past. He is playing like a guy that's ready to play right now because he is. Also talking about his ability to play multiple positions, which they've uh, obviously coveted here. On defense, an outside linebacker, Enik Bari, left at the end of the Bears game. Is he going to be okay? And can you talk about Justin Hollins? How much was his time with the Rams? Does that help him in Joe's defense and what he's been able to do for you so far? Yeah, I think... Both those guys we're, we're really excited about. Obviously, getting a guy like Justin mid-year, that's a shot in the arm. I think he's done some really nice things um, and just obviously adds 
another playmaker on our defense, a guy that brings more depth. And uh, I do think JJ he should be good to go, uh, but we'll see how he how he is out there. We've only had the one practice um, since the Bears game, so but I didn't I didn't notice anything the other day. So obviously some good news about Kingsley and Igbare playing, um, not having any kind of serious injuries, at least not that the coach is aware of. And Hollins is kind of the forgotten man. Um, considering how much of a loss Rashawn Gary is, considering he came from the Rams and, and played under Joe Barry, um, we probably should pay more attention to him and his potential impact because it, it'll make a big difference on the defense. Um, my, my expectations were incredibly low, obviously, but I should know by now anybody that comes to Green Bay that hasn't produced anywhere else, um, the automatic assumption, I guess, should just be, well, this is going to be their breakout <laughs> season. They might not be able to replicate it next year, but they're going to come in here and just tear it up. Now, he hasn't necessarily done that, but I think he's already surpassed some of the stats that he's had in previous years. So, um, yeah, not pro- well, definitely not Rashawn Gary, but hopefully um, we'll be able to exceed what he's done previously and uh, get us some much-needed help because pass rush is going to be a serious issue for us moving forward. We need to generate pass rush, whether that's bringing extra guys or uh, just being creative with the guys we bring, like I'd mentioned with uh, what the Wisconsin Badgers did under Jim Leonard. They would, they would always basically bring four. It was just a matter of which four were coming and which four were dropping that, that you didn't understand that would create mismatches. But we, we have to get creative in being able to generate pass rush because right now we're more or less declaring what we're doing. We're sending those guys, and they're not good enough to get home. Uh, Kenny is not playing at a high level at all. He's actually playing really terribly. So his ability to just beat guys, Preston's ability to just beat guys, it's just not there. Uh, Rashawn was that dude and he's gone now. So next question I thought was kind of funny because it really echoes what I talked about yesterday or two days ago, I guess, uh, with the Pat McAfee show and Aaron Rodgers talking about the schematically, the biggest thing is terminology. The question was how big was it for Hollins to come in, um, working under Joe Barry? Oh, I think it, it was huge in terms of, you know, the acclimation period, it, it was it was definitely shortened um, by the the verbiage, and a lot of that is just you got to learn the terminology. You know, a lot of it, it's it's similar coaching points or whatever it may be, but it's the terminology that to to get guys up to speed and um, the details. Obviously, there's there's intricacies that are going to be a little bit different in our offense or defense or special teams that are going to be different from what the Rams do. So again, very similar, you know, defensive coaching points and, you know, how to run certain this, that, or the other, but terminology is the biggest thing. And having played under Joe Barry before, he didn't need to relearn any of that. He already understood it. There were a couple other things, but I think I'll just leave it at that. Um, Next thing I wanted to look at, uh, I posted some of this a little bit on Twitter. I was somewhat surprised to find this. Granted, Winning out in and of itself is complicated, but I went over to 538.com. They've got this thing where you can just pick who wins, who loses, and it gives you your percentage chance of doing all these things. Obviously, the Packers cannot win the division or get a first-round bye, um, but they can potentially get into the playoffs. As of right now, let me just uh, let's reset this whole thing here. The Packers are sitting at an 8% chance of getting into the playoffs. So let's just walk through this. If we beat the Rams, it jumps up to 10%. If we beat Miami, it jumps up to 24%. Now, this is this is just in a vacuum, right? Obviously, there's going to be other games, and those games in, impact things, but I'm just leaving those blank, right? So continuing on, if we then beat Minnesota, it jumps up to a 48% chance. And then beating Detroit puts us up to a 76%. I put 75 on Twitter. For whatever reason, they have it at 76 now. Um, That was following the result of the 49ers beating the uh, Seattle Seahawks. That was a big one for us and our ability to get into the playoffs. So right now, again, in a vacuum, we'll see how these other games shake out. They are going to massively impact our ability to get in. There's going to be some big games here and there, but 
That's where it stands. Now, the question is, can we be eliminated this week? Well, if again, if we just do in a vacuum and don't look at any other games, if we lose this game and win the rest, we still have a 9% chance, which is a higher percentage than we're currently sitting at, which is, again, 8%. Or there, actually, it might be higher than eight because I think I didn't have the San Francisco thing. I don't know what it is right now. But the lowest percentage I can get to, it's not zero. So again, this is what I've been saying about getting eliminated, where if you really want to see Jordan Love, it's very unlikely that that, that ends up happening. Um, we're down to four. We still have a 4% chance. So no matter what, we're not eliminated next week or this week for next week. So next week, we will go into the game against Miami regardless of what happens, we lose and a bunch of other teams that we need to lose all win, we still have, at worst, a 4% chance. We can then be eliminated if we lose to Miami. I, I, I have us losing to um, the Rams in Miami, and we're done. And that is, that is independent of anything else. So we can lose against the Rams and still be in. If we lose two in a row, it doesn't matter uh, what happens in any other games. We are officially done. We cannot get in no matter what. And that seems to be the case generally. I don't know if there's any combination of two games that we can lose and we still have a chance. So we can lose one and still have a small chance. Maybe there's one game we can lose and not have any chance. I'm not really sure. I'm not going to go through all 50 billion combinations. But um, that seems to be the situation. Uh, In terms of things working in our favor, if we do consider that we win all four games, the odds that we do, I think the highest we can get up to is about a 77% chance, depending on different wins and different losses. Uh, Again, I kind of looked at that on Twitter and whatnot, but the only games that have some kind of impact, it seems, I mean, moving the needle more than just uh, half a percent or whatever. Eagles, Cowboys, Commanders, Panthers, and Lions games. If the Eagles win against the Bears, our odds move up to 77. If the Eagles lose to the Bears, we go down to 74 same with the Cowboys. If they win, it goes to 77. If they lose, it drops to 74. Commanders seems to be probably the biggest one. If the Commanders win, I think they're playing the Giants again. If the Commanders win, our odds go to 77. If they lose, we drop to 72. I think Commanders, Giants all the way down the line are probably going to be the biggest factor for us um, from this point on. And then Panthers, if the Panthers... uh, Panthers win, it drops to 75. If they lose, it goes to 76. Lions game, if the Lions win, we drop to 75. If they lose, we go up to 77. So not that massively different this week, assuming that we are assuming we win all four. So this week, for the rest of the week, not a massive, um, nothing super massive is going to happen this week, but those are a couple games to kind of keep an eye on. Eagles, Cowboys, Commanders, Panthers, and Lions games. But again, I would I would say the two biggest takeaways are if we win out, we we're sitting at 76%, which is a really high chance. I mean, I mean, it's a low chance that we win out, but it's a high chance that if we do, that we will be getting in. Um, the other thing that I would say is is sort of the biggest takeaway is that even if we lose, we're not eliminated. So there's a good chance we're not seeing Jordan Love. They may just say enough is enough, but I kind of doubt it based on some of the comments they've already made. If we're not eliminated, we have to put, you know, I think they'd even gone so far as to say, no matter what, you always put out your best quarterback to win. So if at any point they change to Jordan Love, according to Brian Gutekunst, they're sending a negative message to the team. So I don't really understand that. Again, they'll probably pull some lame excuse about, you know, well, Rodgers is hurt. We want to rest him or whatever. But yeah, I don't think it flies, man. You already made the comment. No matter what, we go out to win. Okay. Don't know why you had to say that. Anyways, a couple more things I wanted to touch on. Big story items. One of them just dropped here um, that I wanted to look at. The other one has been kind of circulating for a few days, so we'll start with that. And that is the idea that if Rodgers comes back, Love is leaving. Now, as per usual, a lot of context gets dropped once it starts circling the national media. The national media story is, as I just said, If Rodgers returns, Jordan Love will seek a trade. The full context is Jason Wildey said he talked with Jordan Love, and the feeling he got is that he would be disappointed, more or less, if uh, he wasn't given the opportunity. 
and would be upset so much that Wildy believes he would seek a trade. It was never relayed directly to Jason Wildy that he would seek a trade. Anyways, here is that full context from Jason Wildy. I had a really great conversation with Jordan uh, on Friday afternoon. I think he very clearly uh, does not, even though he wouldn't flat out say it, he does not want to sit for another year. So if we get to year four and Rodgers does come back, I am fairly confident that he will seek a trade. So again, th- there's not a lot here. We don't know any of the conversation. We don't know how much um, Wildy is reading into things. Essentially, he, first of all, he flat out said that Jordan Love did not tell him this. Um, the sense that he got is that he would not be willing to sit another year. What is that based on? I don't know. The I, I guess the bigger point is, while we don't want to read in too much to how much this is getting blown out of proportion, we also don't want to discredit it for a couple reasons. Number one, um, Wildy got that sense for a reason. And number two, the, the biggest question is, does it make sense? And I think it does. I talked about it a little bit on Packernet After Dark, but I think it does make sense for Jordan Love, especially if he does get to play a little bit this year, a little bit more, and actually plays really well, you know that teams out there will pay for you to come be a starting quarterback. You know that for a fact. And so Love will essentially want to do, potentially, what Aaron Rodgers did to the team and say, I want a commitment or I'm out of here. And unfortunately, I think the Packers did the wrong thing in committing to Aaron Rodgers. And that will be essentially proven too, true if Rodgers doesn't stick around. I mean, again, I can't think of a, a worse scenario than trading love this year and then after this year rogers next year i guess um after and then after the the 2023 season rogers retires what an absolute disaster that would be but the 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 worst part is the best case scenario if we trade love is what rogers plays two years (laughs) that's basically the best case scenario that's not a good scenario now i mean if if jordan loves not the guy then it i guess it doesn't matter either way but if Jordan Love can be the guy, if he can, if he can lead this offense, we can't get rid of him. We cannot for a rent a quarterback, which is what Rodgers is. It has nothing to do with his history. He he is a rental. He is a short term rental. He is retiring very soon. We have no choice but to plan for the future. And if your plan for the future is let's trade Love, that's not a plan. The only way that's a plan is if you've watched him and said, this dude cannot be the guy. And as much as you don't want to throw love at him, you better make it very clear to everybody that Jordan Love was not the guy. You be as polite as you need to be with the way in which you phrase that, but that needs to be made very clear. We love Jordan. We wish him the best. We just don't think that it was a a, a fit for our offense. Something, whatever. I don't care. But if the if the message being sent is no 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 we just we just committed to you know Rodgers we just want Rodgers to be the guy and we needed to do this to commit to Rod- I mean that, that that's that is a disaster. But we'll let that play out as it plays out later in time. Um, the other thing that I wanted to touch on there's a very very long article which is not always my favorite but you know whatever. Uh, Kalen Kaler for The Athletic, wrote an article, Signal Meetings and Aaron Rodgers' Little Death Stare, What It's Like for Packers Rookie Receivers. Um, Again, this was just dropped, uh, at least for me, uh, very recently. And so I don't know how hot takey this is going to get. I don't know if this is going to blow up and become all kinds of things, but why don't we go through it? We'll do the bullet points of what things are said here, and then I'll give my thoughts on what it all means. Uh, First of all, she goes in depth talking about the disparities between the Green Bay Packers draft um, record as far as wide receivers compared to other teams, as well as the production of those receivers. I shouldn't even say of those receivers, overall production of wide receivers taken in the first four rounds compared to other teams. She writes here from 2008 to 2021, Rogers era as the starter in Green Bay, the Packers drafted six receivers in the first round. Uh, Jordy, blah, 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 blah. Um, those receivers finished their rookies av- uh, rookie years averaging 26.7 targets, 19.5 receptions, 230.5 yards, and 1.3 touchdown receptions. 
In the same span, the 31 other teams in the NFL drafted 219 wide receivers in the first four rounds who averaged nearly double the targets as Green Bay's rookies in their first season, 50.7, as well as 30.1 receptions, uh, that's compared to the 19.5, 400 receiving yards compared to 230, and 2.5 touchdowns compared to the 1.3. Goes on to then say, it was uh, then in week 10, Watson broke out, blah, blah, blah. And then there is a quote from Cobb. Quote, during Aaron Rodgers' career, there, uh, there's always been a constant couple of guys already here whenever they draft someone. This is the first time in, in the course of Aaron's career that rookies have been thrust into a position where they have to play right away and play meaningful snaps. In my opinion, no offense to the writer, you spent a lot of paragraphs saying something and then in one paragraph explained it all away. Now, I, I mean, I don't know, maybe it's worth the context i guess i I don't know but that to me entirely explains that while the packers don't draft early enough okay well most teams don't have a Devontae adams on their team so yeah when you have Devontae, you're probably less likely to attack wide receiver in the first round when you have bigger needs than the position that has Devontae in it also you're going to get less production from young guys when you have a team that has had the likes of jordy and randall and and jennings and Devante and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, right? So it makes sense. Not everything is is perfectly equal. Teams have different circumstances, and the Packers have been pretty unique in the fact that they have been pretty loaded at wide receiver for a very long time. So certainly that could account for the disparity, at least to some degree. So in my opinion, the first however many paragraphs, you can kind of just cross it out. It doesn't mean anything. Goes on to talk about the rookies have been thrust in because of Devonte leaving, so we've already seen the uptick in production, which again kind of goes on to further the idea that a lot of the lack of drafting and lack of production was entirely because of the fact that we already get, had guys here. Well, how does that help prove that? The one guy we had left, we drafted more guys, and we're seeing more production. At some point, it starts to shift into the complexity of the offense. Kind of happens pretty abruptly here. It says Devonte left. Uh, The rookies were in over their heads the first half of the season as games slipped away and injuries mounted. Watson missed the first two weeks of training camp, knee injury, blah, blah, blah. Then it says, according to veteran receiver Sammy Watkins, there are, quote, two offenses in one, unquote, which we've already heard about. There's Matt LaFleur's scheme and all the tiny details Rodgers wants executed to perfection, whether it's an angle, yardage, eye, head, or tempo. Watkins, who signed with the Packers in April, said he finds himself confused sometimes despite eight-plus years of NFL experience. I think we're seeing that out there. Quote, if you're not up to date 100% of the time, you pretty much can't go out there and make plays, Watkins said. You can't really play fast, and I think that's what the young guys kind of are not afraid of. But if you're just trying to do the right things, you're not focusing on getting open, you're focusing on releases. So in this case, we're talking about stunted growth. It's not, not only are they rookies and so they're going to play like rookies, but it's harder to get up to speed in this particular offense because you have to learn so much. And rather than just going out and playing and trying to be a good wide receiver, you're focused on nuance. Romeo Dobbs was asked if he had earned Rodgers' trust. Here was his comment. I don't know. I know uh, with this being my first year here, playing for a Hall of Fame quarterback obviously has been the biggest learning curve for me. So he goes on to say that because he's a Hall of Fame quarterback, that's made it little more difficult and it's not just for myself it's for christian and samori it's uh so it's been a really tough transition then it goes on to talk about a a detail that i've never really heard before uh where it talks about these signals it says saturdays are typically the easiest day of the nfl week players come in watch film from practice and then go through a little light walkthrough there's no real physical exertion required but for packers rookie offensive skill players saturdays are the most mentally exhausting day of the week The signal meeting was by far the worst thing, said former Packers receiver Chris Blair, who spent the 2021 season on Green Bay's practice squad. I used to hate those. Rodgers uses hand signals at the line of scrimmage to change a route or a concept. You're probably familiar with a few of his most common ones. The helmet tap, the one where he holds his left arm behind his back with his thumb pointed down, otherwise where he raises his index uh, finger and quickly rotates it, uh, and another that looks like the Hawaiian hang loose sign. On Saturdays, rookie receivers, running backs, and tight ends get quizzed on them. Quote, you don't want to get called on because you got to do it in front of the whole team, said former Packers receiver Equinemia St. Brown, who now plays for the Bears. It's probably the most nerve-wracking for young players because we don't get uh, taught them, said former Green Bay Packers running back Kylan Hill, who was drafted in 2021 and released in November. You have to learn them on the fly. One thing I do like about this is that everybody's named, so you can't play the whole 
unnamed sources. Yeah, right. Well, they're named in this one, so. That's definitely something young wide receivers don't look forward to is the signal meeting because we have uh, because we have so many, said backup quarterback Jordan Love. You don't want any of that stuff getting out, so we wait until the season starts to start going through the signals. None of the current or former Packers players interviewed for this story could place an exact number on how many signals Rodgers expects his offense to know, but several estimated a number somewhere around 30. What's so crazy is all the coaches don't even know them, Blair said. It's really a thing that you really have to learn from watching Rodgers in practice or asking one of the vets. Blair said uh, that when watching film in Green Bay, coaches would sometimes think a receiver ran a wrong route, but we would be able to show them, like, no, Aaron showed us the signal. The signals are not written down anywhere. They're not searchable on the team's issued iPad, and there's no handy film cut up to watch them all in one go. It's just in our brains, Love said. The veterans pass them down in in an oral tradition, but the rookies have to ask for help or try to pick them up on their own during the live action of practice and games. We don't teach them because players get released every day or traded, so we don't want to give anybody we don't want anybody giving out A Rod signals. St. Brown said when he was a rookie in 2018, he stayed late every Friday after practice with fellow rookie MVS and a coach to review the plays and learn the signals. The closest thing to a written record is a list of calls that Love creates each week. Each call or route or concept corresponds to a specific signal. He said the list is three columns deep and only for the quarterback's use. Wide receivers aren't allowed to get that, he said, especially the young guys when they first get here. So essentially there is, and we all know that there's signals, but we just assume every team has signals. It's not that big of a deal, but apparently in Green Bay, it's a much bigger deal. There's a lot of signals, like a lot of them, and they are all Roger signals. The coaches don't even know. Beyond that, it's, it's complicated because Rogers expects you to know them perfectly, but he also keeps them under lock and key and won't really show anybody them. He goes on to talk about how some of these signals are ones that he'll bring back from something he used like 10 years ago, and only guys like Cobb know about them. He says, Rogers used to be the one to call players up to the front of the auditorium to perform signals on demand on Saturdays, but he delegated the job to Love last season. It's amazing to me how much Rogers runs this team. The entire team is in the auditorium, and Rogers is running a signals uh class and he is the one calling players up to the front of the auditorium but not only did he have that power now he has decided to delegate that job to the rookie so rogers has orchestrated a signals class and has mandated that jordan love call players up to the front of the auditorium to perform signals for the entire team that seems crazy to me says when they say signals all the young players heads go down hill said when you don't make eye contact that's when rogers calls on you it's rare for any young player to ace the selection of signals he's given to identify or vice versa quote some right some wrong that's part of the process dobbs said blair said he always mixed up signals for the hitch thumbs up and stick thumbs down routes here is where it says aaron will bring back uh signals from five or six years ago that he used to have in an older offense love said He'll just signal it out there, and you just have to kind of got to know it. And if you don't know, you just have to figure it out. It's hard for the young guys. How does that even make sense? (laughs) I don't get it. Love is now in his fourth year in Green Bay, but he still hasn't seen the full vault. The older guys will remember them and know them, but we will see it on the side, and we'll be like, what signal is that, Love said. I don't know. Go ask him and figure it out. That's the answer that's given. And then from there, it kind of pivots to what it's like to play with Rodgers and his personality and all that. Talks about Watson, he dropped the ball, oh my goodness, crazy. He lost some confidence. Um, So they had a noticeable change in Watson after he had that drop. He lost his confidence a little bit. You could see it in practice and in the next games, uh, Byer said. Byer's a former tight end. And I think that is uh, tough to gain your confidence back. He has made that catch a million times over, and that's why he got drafted where he did. You're thinking, oh, I let Aaron Rodgers down. He's not going to trust me. I think it would shake anybody, Watkins said. If you catch that ball, we win that game. That changes the whole trajectory of the season. Then it goes on to say, Watson has since rebounded from that disappointing start, but some players in Green Bay never recover from their original break. The current and former Packers players who spoke for this story said Rodgers isn't the type to shout or yell at young players for making a mistake. He doesn't need words to do that. Quote, he'll give you a little stare and you know you need to step it up and lock it in, Hill said. 
looks like a little death stare. That's the worst feeling when you know you effed up, said tight end Jay Sternberger, a third-round pick in 2019 for the first offensive skill player Green Bay drafted in the LaFleur era. Rodgers doesn't say anything. It's just the look in his eyes like, is this kid ever going to figure it out? Green Bay cut Sternberger. He's since played with Seattle, Washington, and Pittsburgh, and he goes on to say that uh, Green Bay's offense is more detailed and complicated than anywhere else that he's been. Equinemia St. Brown is now playing with second-year quarterback Justin Fields in Chicago, where he said he's more involved in the offense than he was in Green Bay. He goes on to say, quote, With a quarterback like Aaron, he's going. Uh, he's been doing it for so long that he knows what he likes, so if he likes a certain route this way, you run it that way for him because that's how he's been doing it, St. Brown said. With a young quarterback like Justin, we get to have more conversations about how we, how we want to run it, how I like it, because maybe it's a new route for him too. Does having a say in the offense with a younger quarterback create a better learning environment for a young receiver than being told what exactly to do and how to uh, do it with a veteran quarterback? I wouldn't say a better learning environment, St. Brown said. Regardless, if it was the way it was for 15 years or 10 years before I got there, I'm going to learn it and do it the way he wants to. I still got to be on the same page as my quarterback. I don't have to uh, have a say-so of anything, and I think that should be expected based on the majority of rookies, Dobbs said. Whatever Rodgers has to say is whatever he has to say, but I know it will always be a W in the end. Robert Tunyon's take on it is uh, playing with somebody of Rodgers' pedigree might be more stressful, but it's good for you. Then it goes on to talk about Amari Rodgers. Here's what he had to say. He doesn't really have conversations outside of football with many people, so that kind of maybe played a role, just not being able to feel personable towards him, not all connected, so you don't really feel comfortable to say things or communicate the way that you would want to because of that. That played a part more than anything. Then Hill chimes in and says the majority of young players will be more shy or scared to speak to him because we all just watched him uh, throughout growing up. Randall Cobb's take is, this isn't high school, this isn't college, this is a job, and you have to treat it as such. Not everyone is going to have a great relationship like you are coworkers. I don't, uh, I don't talk and hang out with everybody on the team. It's really difficult. I can understand from Amari's perspective why he can feel that way. Because Aaron is a very intimidating person, uh, talking about he has multiple MVP, Super Bowl winning quarterback, and if you don't have confidence to go up and have a conversation and ask, then yeah, I can see how that could be. Interesting little side story within the story. Um, it says, Rodgers has his own group of veterans he is comfortable with, while the three rookie receivers have formed their own little clique, according to Tunyon. While the rest of the offense spreads out during meetings with seats in between each other, Watson, Dobbs, and Ture sit right next to each other in the front row. It's good for them to do that, Tunyon said, because you have to have someone you can rely on. The three have handshakes together, and after Watson scored his second touchdown at Chicago, his first career rushing score, Watson and Ture got together to do their unique version, a swinging, kicking, leaning choreography. Things are getting better for the rookies, but it was just a few weeks ago that Rodgers hinted at wanting his team to make a move at the trade deadline for a receiver. Quote, there's a possibility of certain guys emerge of us having a chance to make a run, Rodgers told a reporter after the Jets uh, at home in week six. I know GM Brian Gutekunst believes the same thing, but if there is an opportunity, I expect Brian would be in the mix. Anyways, that's that's more or less it. Um, I mean, the, the, the good part of the article is that it clearly is not trying to paint a picture from one direction because every single thing that is said is also contradicted. And I have to assume that that's on purpose. We're, we're gathering different perspectives. The, the, the biggest overarching theme I have on this story, because I'm sure a lot of people will pick certain parts out and, and run with those particular parts, is that nothing is black and white. You have certain people that get along with certain people and certain people that don't get along with certain people. There are people who will thrive with Aaron Rodgers. There are people that probably can't stand Aaron Rodgers. Depending on your personality, depending on your you know, work ethic, study habits, your abilities to do this, that, or the other thing, it's very possible, like for example, Amari Rogers, that you could really struggle here and then thrive somewhere else. I don't think there was any one thing in this article that I could pick on to say, oh, that's kind of crazy. Like that's, that's really bad or that's really good. Um, the hand signal thing is not great. Largely because I, I think what it does is reinforces what I've kind of already been saying, and that is Rodgers operates as a guy who likes to work with guys that already know what they're doing. Rodgers is not really used to this. 
as Randall Cobb said, he's always had those core group of guys that know what they're doing. And it's not just wide receivers. He's, for the most part, had running backs and offensive linemen, maybe not tight ends as much. Uh, he does now, I think, with Tunyon and Mercedes. But there's always been those guys that, that have been there for a long time and know what they're doing and do a really good job. Again, offensive line and uh, wide receiver and even, even running back to some degree, especially now with Aaron Jones. And so, and, and Rodgers being as good as he is, and he is very, very good, and he is incredibly intelligent. Um, he has a, a, a really, really good memory, which is good for what he does. And, and, and so it's easy for him to have 30 signals and all these different things because his, his memory, he just remembers all this stuff. But I don't know that the way Rodgers likes to play football is the most conducive to a team that has young players and needs to lean on them. That would be the only real takeaway. However, it doesn't really matter because look where we are. They're making it work. Maybe it could have gotten to where it is a little faster had things been different. Maybe, maybe not. I don't know. Um, I, I do think that is a, in part a consequence of Amari leaving. I don't think Rodgers really liked Amari, and I don't think Amari really liked being here. I don't think he felt comfortable around Rodgers. I think he was really struggling and, and didn't, you know, he was like me in school. I, w- I never, ever in my life would raise my hand in class, even though a lot of times I needed to. I think I was relatively smart and usually understood what was going on, but when I didn't, would not raise my hand. Does anybody have any questions? Nope. I just wouldn't do it. There's no way I'm going to raise my hand and say, hey, I'm the one idiot in this entire group that doesn't get it. I'm not doing that. And so I would just hope that somebody else doesn't get it and would be the one to proclaim that they're an idiot and they don't get it. It's my, it's my problem. <laughs> but, but it's still a thing. And so, yeah, I think Amari had issues, and, and a lot of it had to do, I mean, he can go to his coaches, and he can go to guys that he trusts and other wide receivers, but unless you can get on the same page with Rodgers, it doesn't matter. And apparently, according to this article, he wasn't really willing to do it. He felt like, you know, he was a little shy or whatever the case may be, intimidated by Rodgers and, and unable to do it, or maybe he had some bad interactions with Rodgers, and I don't know. But again, the 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 overarching thing that I can get from this is, yeah, Rodgers is not everybody's cup of tea, and some people are not going to get along with him, and some people are really not going to like this offense and, the, and how complex it is. I think Sammy Watkins is somewhat regretting coming here. Um, not re- I mean, he's, again, I'm an eight-year veteran, and I don't know what I'm doing out there. Had he known that it was going to be this bad, I wonder if he would have maybe chosen to go somewhere else. In his mind, it's like, yeah, dude, I'm going to work with Rodgers and the Packers, and it's going to be great. I can go there and be a number one wide receiver. And he gets in there and Rodgers is showing them all. I mean, you got the playbook and then Rodgers is like, oh, by the way, there's an additional playbook. Oh, and there's like 30 hand signals that I'll be slowly teaching you over time. And it's like, dude, I don't know. I mean, how many times have we seen Sammy run the wrong way? Constantly. He's lost. He's completely lost. It's not for him. Which, by the way, is, is one of the benefits of getting Christian Watson, who apparently also is unbelievably intelligent. So Rodgers is throwing stuff at him and he's... He's getting it. I mean, he's, he's making mistakes. There was the back shoulder throw last week where he just was not on the same page. I think there was a second throw uh, where he's geared down and cut behind the receiver to the outside like he's running an out route, and Rodgers sails it to the uh, to the deep, you know, sideline, and he wasn't going out there. I, I, you know, I think there's still growing pains, but again, it's still it's still looking pretty good. The offense is working fairly well. I think the the complexity of it and, and the way Rodgers plays is still kind of causing things to be a little clunky, but it's really starting to pick up. And despite everything written in here, the, at the end of the day, the issue with our team is our defense. It's not our offense. Rodgers is not playing at, at a MVP level this year. We don't have Devontae anymore. We've got issues along the offensive line. We've got rookies and, and guys that don't really know what they're doing uh, at wide receiver, and still it's better than our... <laughs> top-tier, uh, wall-to-wall first-round pick defense, which is uh, pretty shocking. So, again, I don't know what this is going to blow up into. I've already seen a couple of people tweeting about it, and I'm, I'm thinking it has the potential to kind of spiral. I don't, I don't see too much here. Um, it's, it's a complicated offense, which we knew. It's maybe a little bit more complicated than we thought. Rodgers has a death stare. We know. We see it every Sunday. Um, and he's he's not super approachable, and he's intimidating, which I think we probably could have guessed that just based on who he is. But I don't think you can make black... And, I mean, are there benefits if we move on to a guy like Jordan? Yes. 
Are there drawbacks? Yes. There's, there's positive and negatives to everything. Some people are going to like, some people probably already do like Jordan more than Rodgers. You ever work at a place where um, you have a boss that's maybe not quite as good at his job, but you just like him more? You know, he's a little bit more laid back, somewhat incompetent, but he's just a cool guy and he's never really going to get on your case. Which boss is better? Depends what you mean. He's not as experienced. He doesn't know what he's doing, but the guys like working for him more and it's better for, I would rather work for, you know, I mean, honestly, I mean, this is your daily life. Let's say the team isn't quite as good. Let's say the quarterback isn't as good. It's got to be a little frustrating to not have a quarterback that's as good, but if you like your work environment more, if it's a less stressful environment, you probably would still rather be with that person. And again, that's not everybody. I'm not saying everybody hates Rodgers. I'm just saying for some people, that's going to be a reality. I'm guessing that the tradition of Jordan Love calling guys up to the front of the room for signals is not going to continue when Rodgers leaves. Maybe it will. I don't know. I mean, Jordan Love doesn't even know all the signals, so it'd be hard for him to <laughs> to do it, but I don't know. We're 40 minutes in. We're taking way too long with all this, but I guess we'll take a break here um, and come back and start poking at the Rams. We don't have as much time as I had hoped, but uh, we'll take a break. We'll come right back. I want to tell you guys real quick about our new sponsor, Factor. Factor makes delicious, ready-to-eat meals, and they get sent right to your door. They have 35 different options every single week that you can choose from including keto, calorie smart, vegan and veggie, and more. And there's even more to enjoy with over 55 nutrition-packed add-ons that help make your weekly meal planning even more delicious. There's no prep work. There's no messing up six different bowls, mixing stuff. Factor meals are 100% ready to heat and eat. No prep, no cook, no cleanup. Factor is also very flexible with your schedule. You can get as much or as little as you need by choosing between 6 to 18 meals per week. You can also pause or reschedule your deliveries anytime. Factor is less expensive than takeout, and every meal is dietitian approved. So head to factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 and use code packdaddy50 to get 50% off. That's code packdaddy50 at factormeals.com slash packdaddy50 to get 50% off. Ladies and gentlemen, let me ask you a question. Have you ever heard in your entire life of test driving a phone network? Well, now you have, because U.S. Cellular is going to let you test drive their network for free for 30 days. So anywhere you go where you got some dead spots, where your service isn't super strong, you're trying to listen to the podcast and it drops out when you go here because you got no internet service anymore, real simple, just whip out your phone, do a little beep boop bop boop that's you pushing the buttons to go to the right place and you can get the app and try it out for yourself so go ahead and test drive u.s cellular's award-winning network free for 30 days that's u.s cellular built for us terms apply awards based on open signal independent data so go to uscellular.com for all the details all right so let's look at the rams shall we the only thing I've really touched on on that so far is that my thesis generally has been more given that we're able to run the ball. Because if we can't, then we get one dimensional and they can win up front with just a couple and Rodgers is under duress and blah, blah, blah. And so my concern was well, if you look at the Rams, they're fourth in yards per attempt, giving up just four yards per attempt. Uh, they are fifth in total yards given up. So that's concerning. Uh, Let's do a couple things here. First of all, let's get specific as opposed to just saying, you know, win or lose. Well, they're good against the run, we lose. Specifically, you know, once in a while, what I'll do is I'll look at the correlations, right? So when we score this much, we win. When we give up this much, we lose, blah, blah, blah. Usually rush yards has very little to do with anything, and it's not worth even bringing up. The Packers have needed such a massive crutch with running, it's kind of unbelievable. There have been several teams in the past that have been sort of run-focused, and it's, it's a matter of when they can run for 100 yards or more, they win. For the Packers, when they run for 175 yards or more, they're 4-1. and one. When they run for less than 175 yards, they are 1-7. and seven. Thought I was lying about this running stuff, didn't you? That is the second worst record 
in the NFL. The only team that has a worse record is the Houston Texans. Go figure. <laughs> they are 1-11-1. Why? Because they've never run for 175 yards, and that's just their record. 1-7. and seven. Chicago Bears are the next worst at 1-5. and five. And that isn't even necessarily to say that we have this elite record um, when we run for 175 yards, because half the league is undefeated when they've run for that much. 15 teams are undefeated when they've run for 175 yards or more. The fact of the matter is, though, the Packers either do that, that thing that almost guarantees victory, or we don't win, period. The Rams' defense um, has never given up 175 yards in a game. Uh, 165 is the most they've given up. Now, obviously, this is not hard and fast rule. Either we get to 175 or we lose, and the Rams will not give up 175, therefore automatically we lose. No. But I'll tell you this, seven-point favorites, so far, without further investigation, a little shaky on that. Now, if there is any good news here, I would say is twofold. One is what I've already brought up, is that I do think the Packers have become less reliant on the run. Now, that hasn't shown up in terms of actually winning without getting all these rushing yards yet. The only opportunity we had to do that was against Tennessee, and we lost. So it's more of a theory than anything I can prove, but it certainly seems that way with, uh, I think Aaron Rodgers has been playing a little better, and Christian Watson obviously has emerged, and we get Romeo back, which hopefully can help us. I'm not sure. We shall see. The other... um, positive is that the Rams being fourth in yards per attempt is for the season, not necessarily anything they've done recently. In fact, they've been kind of slipping a little bit, uh, in my opinion. They've given up over 100 yards just five times this year, but two of those came in the last three weeks, and the one sandwiched in between was 90 yards. The unfortunate part about that is that they were pretty good running teams. The Packers rank uh, seventh in yards per attempt, The teams that did it to him were the uh, Raiders, who rank third. That's the team that got to 165, which is the highest, which, again, is a problem. It's the most recent game, and it's the best rushing team they faced, and they got to 165. We rank eighth, and our goal is 175 so that we can win this game. So, again, even if I come with you at the argument, well, they're not as good anymore, if it was going to happen, it would have been last week. So essentially what I I guess I'm saying is the Packers are going to need to win without getting to 175. That's going to have to happen. And forget about 175, that they're going to have to learn to win without a run game. Now don't get me wrong, I would love to be able to just sit here and say, hey, this is a good run team, let's just run it down their throat anyways and let's impose our will. Yeah, I mean, if you can do that, awesome. That'd be great. It's like, let's say your friend has a fear of elevators. And so you take the stairs with them as often as you can. And you go to this place and they're, let's just say they don't even have stairs. And you're like, all right, I guess this is it. This is a great opportunity for you to get over your fear of elevators. And so we're just going to have to get in the elevator. And they're like, how about this? Let's scale the building. No, dude, get in the freaking elevator. You got to learn. You got to overcome this. And so the, you know, the Packers have a lot of issues. And I love being able to tell you, hey, all the only issue we really have right now is defense. And if we could do that, our offense is good enough. We can win it. Okay, but here's the thing. If we can't beat a team without running for less than 175 yards, we have more issues than just defense. There's a lot of different teams with a lot of different strengths and weaknesses. And we need to be a well-rounded enough team to be able to go up against different teams with different strengths and say, You you know, if you're going to shut that down, we'll beat you here. If you're going to take this away, we're going to beat you over here. If it's as simple as we're pretty sure we're going to be good enough to not let you get nearly 200 rushing yards, and we're like, well, then we're out. We're done. Screw this. Not even going to try. You're not going to give me 200 yards? I'm done. I quit. No, dude. (laughs) We should be able to win running for like 90 yards, 75 yards. So here here is the other way to look at it. And it's the final thought on having a positive spin on this. And that is the Rams have been very beatable while also not giving up a ton of yards. Because in a way, you could almost compare the amount of yards to points. And let's say because we can't run for as much, we can't score as much. Okay, that's fine. The Rams 
Their biggest off, uh, issue has been their offense. They have reached 24 points twice. They've scored more than 24 points once. They scored 31 against the Falcons in week two. They've scored less than 20 points eight times, 20 or less points 10 times. So the bar isn't necessarily that high. However, if we can go back, 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 back and forth, here are the scores the Packers have had when uh, rushing for less than 175. Uh, 7, 9, 33, 22, 14, 10, 17, 21. So more than 22 points once, and that was against the Eagles, 33 points, and we lost the game. Uh, the only win was the Tampa Bay win. We scored 14 points in that game. Defense won us that game, clearly. Um, so yeah, we, we have to learn to play football, to score points, and to win games without being absolutely dragged to a victory by Aaron Jones and A.J. Dillon. I mean, this is very similar to what Rodgers has done for this team for years, but instead of Rodgers now, it is, it's Aaron Jones putting the team on his back. Anyways, we'll take a look at this from different angles uh, moving forward, but this, this to me is, is the most important central piece to all of this. Um, I know the Rams are struggling, but uh, they've got the only thing going for them that could stand in the Packers' way. So, anyways, you guys have yourselves a great day. I will talk to you tomorrow. Have a good one. Bye-bye.